So you've probably been hearing a lot about how the fluoro wax ban is going to be affecting both the IBU and FIS cross country circuits this season. But you're probably asking yourself, what is a fluoro? What exactly was banned? What does this mean for competition? And what can teams still do to produce fast skis? All your questions and more will be answered in this video. I'm going to go over the history of waxing, talk a little bit about the science behind waxing, and talk about the new rules that are being enforced, and give my opinion as to what to expect on the Biathlon World Cup this season. How's it going? Biathlon fans, welcome back to the channel. My name is Brian Halligan. This is my YouTube channel about biathlon. Now, a lot of time and research went into this, and I actually learned a lot while doing the research for this video. So, the least you can do is hit that subscribe button and share this video with your biathlon friends or cross country ski friends and help me clean that 5K target. I really want to see if I can clean 5K before the end of the race season. All right, let's get into a little bit of the history behind ski waxing. Now, manipulating the base of a ski has been a part of skiing forever. Early cross-country skiers used to use tar in their kick zones to provide kick and even wax the glide zones to reduce the coefficient of friction as you're sliding across the snow. As cross-country ski and biathlon racing became more popular, wax brands began to rise and offer products that were specific for cross-country skiing conditions. Even in as early as 1946, Swix launched the colored wax system and became the world leader in waxing cross-country skis. Now the colored wax system was a major breakthrough in cross-country skiing because the different waxes were used to combat different snow conditions. For example, in cold snow, the snow crystal is very sharp and very abrasive, whereas in warmer snow, the snow crystal is very soft and even wet. The color system that Swix launched was basically different products that could hold up to different levels of abrasiveness on the snow. Creating wax for different types of abrasiveness became a huge competitive advantage for wax brands early in the day. However, there's still a major problem. As the ski rides over the snow, the movement and slight friction causes a thin layer of snow to melt and a small layer of water supports the ski atop the snow. This water could actually cause a suction effect and would literally grab the ski. And this is the reason the introduction of the fluorocarbon into the wax mixture became an interesting experiment. A fluorocarbon is extremely hydrophobic material. And so with a fluoro in the wax, that thin layer of water that the ski rides on is literally now actually being repelled wow. from the base of the ski causing the ski to glide very smoothly with no suction whatsoever. So in the late 1980s, wax brands began mixing fluorocarbons into their formula. And for anyone who's raced on a pair of fluorinated race skis, you know that the results are magical. <laughs> in fact, one of the first times that fluorocarbons were used in competition was actually the 1988 Calgary Olympics. Now there are some other strategies that waxers will use to try to repel that thin layer of water between the ski and the snow, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Now as great as this technology was, you can imagine that there are some detrimental health and environmental impacts from using such a hydrophobic material. Constant puffs of hydrophobic gas and smoke in your face, getting in your lungs and in your body, that is not good for your health at all. And not to mention the absolutely detrimental environmental impacts of a product that literally repels water getting into the ecosystem. Now to be clear, it's not just ski waxes that have these fluorocarbons in them. Fluoros are used in a variety of products Products, anything that you want to be water resistant, there's probably fluorocarbons in it. And I'm talking everything from rain jackets to waterproof sprays uh, to a lot of industrial uh, and commercial uses. So ski waxing makes up a very small portion of the fluorocarbon industry, but because of the detrimental impact of this little fluorocarbon, the EU has actually moved forward to ban the manufacturing and the sale of fluorocarbons. And as a result, ski waxes are part of that ban. This is what has prompted wax companies, the IBU and FIS to change their rules and ultimately ban the use of fluorocarbons before the ban in the EU actually goes into effect. So as of this year, FIS and the IBU have officially banned the use of fluorocarbons in biathlon and cross country skiing. But the problem is enforcement. And we know from the countless examples of doping in endurance sports that if there's an opportunity to cheat, people will do it. So after a lot of time, money, and research into this enforcement issue, the IBU has finally unveiled their fluorocarbon testing procedure, and it's a solution that they think is fair and equitable for this problem. So here are the new rules for the IBU. FIS might be a little bit different. I don't follow them as closely. <laughs> All right, really quick, just in time for the holiday season, I got some Biathlon merch. So check the link in the description down below to see how you can get some channel-specific Biathlon merch. If you're a biathlete or you know a biathlete or you're just a 
a biathlon fan. This is the perfect holiday gift for them. You gotta make your order soon because the holidays are right around the corner and you wanna give it some time to get to your location. All the designs you see on there are designed by me and it goes 100% to supporting me in this YouTube channel. So check the link in the description down below. Get yourself some biathlon merch. Let's get back. This season, every athlete will need to submit their race skis 30 minutes prior to their start. Once the ski is submitted, it will be tested with proprietary technology in three different locations on the ski. This tech will come back with a reading that will tell the race organizer how much fluoros are in the base of the ski. Now a fully fluoroed ski with, you know, something that's waxed to the nines will come back with a reading between 20 and 30. The thresholds that the IBU is going with is 1 to 1.8. And with these readings, they've established a color system. Any readings that are under 1.0 is a green light and the athlete is good to go. Any athletes between 1 and 1.8 is a yellow and anything over 1.8 is a red. Any yellow on the ski, whether it's in two spots or even just one spot, results in a warning. And then if there's any red on the ski, whether it's just in one spot or the entire ski, that athlete cannot race. And just like in soccer or football for my European audience, two yellows equals a red. Now because there are going to be some hiccups in the first year of implementing this process, if you produce a red before the race, you have one opportunity, one opportunity during the season to change that ski and get on the start line for that race. Moving forward, if you have a red before the race, you cannot race. And same with the yellow. After you have two yellow warnings, you do get one opportunity to switch that ski and continue to race. After the race, every ski will be tested again. And if you come up with a red after the race, it's a disqualification. If you come up with your second yellow after a race, it's a disqualification. So take a look while you're watching Biathlon this year and you will see that the athletes will be picking up their skis as they're making their way to the start line. Now this can cause some major problems this year because think of all the skis and equipment that were used last season that have a ton of fluoro in them. Now this summer, Wax Techs have been going crazy trying to clean all the skis and equipment from last year, but don't be surprised if there's some early season reds or yellows as we get used to this new protocol in this new system. Now one of the major issues that fans are citing with this new protocol is the inequity within the sport. Think of a big budget team like Sweden or Norway who can throw out their whole wax room and replace it with brand new clean material. In fact, Norway actually literally did that with their wax truck. They just got rid of their wax truck and just bought a new one. Now the other area that we might see some inequity is going back to that other way that you can make skis fast. So we talked about that thin layer of water between the ski and the snow. Another way to try to repel that water from underneath the base of the ski and reduce suction is what's called structure and grind. Now basically what a structure and a grind is, is it's a channel that is dug into the base of the ski and it acts like a gutter to really repel and flush out the water from underneath the ski to reduce suction. Now a grind is a more permanent pattern that gets pressed into the ski with a big machine. Once it's in there, it's pretty much good to go for the life of the ski. A structure on the other hand is a less permanent solution and it's a way for wax techs to implement a pattern that's specific for the day. Now here's where the inequity comes in. When you put a fluorocarbon on the base of a ski, it immediately makes your ski fast. It doesn't matter if you have the absolute perfect wax for the day, just by putting a fluorocarbon wax on your ski, it immediately makes the ski fast. And then using specific waxes and different combinations of structures and grinds, they try to fight for one or 2% advantage over their competitors. But here's the problem. With no fluoros, everyone is starting starting at zero and with structure and grind, you have to try to get a big advantage as you can. And if you mess up on the day or you just go down the wrong path, you could be so far behind a team that found the absolute perfect pattern for the day. Now, how big of a problem is this? Let me explain. What's the difference between a chevron pattern that looks like this and a chevron pattern that looks like this? They're very small differences, but it can make a huge difference depending on the snow, the humidity within the snow, how old the snow is, etc. Again, what's the difference between a structure that you press really firmly into the base of the ski and a really light one. Also, do you start your structure from the tip and go all the way to the tail? Or do you start at the binding and only do the back of the ski? There's infinite possibilities, solutions, combinations, and mix and matching that requires a lot of time, knowledge, and human power to really break down and find the best pair. At some point, we do run out of time and the race has to start, the skis need to get waxed. So bigger teams that have bigger budgets might be able to 
to afford more staff to do more testing. Also, they can afford bigger wax boxes with way more combinations. What if the perfect pattern for today's race is a chevron pattern at a specific angle and a team like Norway and Sweden, they have that in their toolbox, but a smaller team like the US or Latvia or Estonia, for example, they might not have that specific pattern and they have to make do with what they have. So the best way to see if there's gonna be any inequity on the circuit this year is to watch athletes as they go down the hill. Is there one team that's pulling away on the downhills? Is there another team that just can't seem to stay with the group? There's gonna be a massive underlying arms race to the biathlon circuit this year. And I really hope that your team was able to figure it out over the summer. <laughs> All right, if you learned something in today's video, hit that subscribe button and share this video with anyone who is still confused about this whole fluorocarbon wax band thing. Let me know in the comments down below what you think is gonna happen this year. Are we gonna see major inequities or is it all gonna just work out? But I hope you enjoyed this video and until next time, we'll see ya.